Most agents call themselves full-time because this is the only job they have. That's the definition of full-time to most agents. It's not because they put in the hours to consider themselves full-time. Appreciate you having me on, dude. Had a, had a cool conversation with Michael the other night as well. And uh, it's, it's pretty neat. You get to kind of watch what you guys are doing, certainly from a distance in some ways. But, you know, I, I, obviously I follow you closely. And um, I love seeing the excitement that you have right now and like it looks like a great home for you and your personality and everything you're trying to do and the conversations we've had like the build of something something new and exciting is is is, is obviously fun um so i appreciate you having me on i'll certainly um give a little background um which is you know what what got me to write the book um is i do love sharing the opportunity with people that's available um because it's like I didn't come into this business killing it, you know, and I think a lot of people get into the business and they feel like they see opportunity, but they don't quite know how to get there. Um, and I feel like I can relate to a lot of people because I struggled early on. I've, I've been in the business now officially 12 years as what I say, but it's really been 15 plus. And I, I'll, I'll tell you the example, um, the, the full story for those that, that don't know, which I, I, I can see you have a couple of hundred, almost 300 people on now, which is cool. Um, I actually got started, um, I applied to be in the business in 2008, Marty. I answered a Craigslist ad. It was a mortgage protection and final expense ad on Craigslist. And uh, I answered it. And um, at the time, I was an accountant. So I was a staff accountant working for a company, crunching numbers, doing books, accounts payable, things like that. Um, tracking down salespeople for their expense reports, just like very tedious accounting work. Making 40 grand a year. I have five kids um, total. My first I had at 16. So I, I grew up, I was a kid having kids, um, grew up to a sing, with a single mom on welfare, had my first um, child as a teenager. So in high school, I was paying for daycare, went on to uh, work in the restaurant business for four years, worked in a warehouse business for, for in, a, in a warehouse for four years, and knew I wanted more out of life, um, but didn't know quite where to go. Don't have a sales background. Went to college in my mid-20s to get a degree, and I chose accounting, and I did that for about 10 years. And uh, that, and in 2008, I applied to an ad because I was just trying to figure out how to um, pay my bills, dude, you know, pay for the kids to like have something, you know, be in a sport, you know, so I was, I was tired of saying no to them for my entire basically adulthood. And, uh, you know, 08, you obviously met Stephanie, my, my wife, um, we've been married since 2010. But at that time, dude, we were like every Sunday, we were clipping coupons, bro, to go grocery shopping. You know what I mean? I'd go to the grocery store with a calculator and the coupon book that she had worked out. And if you didn't like have the right coupons with the right sale and get the, get the item for free, we couldn't buy it. She was just like, you know, we had like an $80 budget for five kids at the time. And I was tired of that, dude. And uh, thankfully I had, um, so I, I, I applied to this ad and uh, I'm like, hey, send me this stuff. I want to, I'm ready to kill it. And it took me until March of 2010 to get my license. <laughs> so a year and a half before I did the pre-license course. And then it took me till August of 2012 to sell my first policy. So I spent four years kind of just like watching the industry. You know, quite frankly, the very first time when I got my license 2010, I picked up the phone. I called leads. I made about 30, 40 phone calls, got hung up on and yelled at a handful of times, and I quit. And I went back to accounting and I sat on the sidelines for two, two more years. And looking back on it now, I'm like, man, that's what most people do, especially when it comes to the lead side, right? Which is new for, for a lot of y'all. It's a, it's a, it's a very different business. Um, but it's lucrative as all get out. But I think it's, it's, it's learning to have the right understanding of it. So I get into the business again, 2012, I come back in because I'm tired of the job. I was tired of the day to day. I hated my job. I had an hour and a half commute. I was working for someone I didn't want to work for. I was tired of being told when to go to the bathroom and when I could take vacation. I just, I was tired, dude. Um, you know, and commuting 60 miles in Atlanta traffic every day for four years was, it was a lot to make 40 grand. And, um, yeah, you know, 2012, I was tired, man. So I, I come into the business and um, I do it part time for a year, working mainly final expense early on. And um, I made like 60 grand my first year part time, which was respectable. Um, good money to a lot of people getting started. And um, 
you know, investing in leads, I probably netted 40, but it was more than I was making on my accounting job. So I was like, damn, there's something to this. There's something here. I could like almost touch it, but it wasn't quite enough to like change my world. You know what I mean? It's like you make that kind of money. It's like, all right, I'm making 20 grand more a year. Great. I, I get a new car. Oh, and it's all gone. <laughs> you know what I mean? It wasn't, there wasn't much there. Um, and I messed around, man, in the business for like the next two years. All of 2013, I was full-time. Or half of 2013, I was full-time. All of 2014, I was full-time. And I was like, I don't know if any of y'all can relate. I've been in the business for a little while. And it's like, you make a few bucks one week, and then you don't make any money the next week. Or a client cancels. You know what I mean? A chargeback happens the same week you're going on vacation. And it's like, it all sort of hits at once. You know what I mean? It's like, ah, like, how I do think I... everybody knows that. Yeah, you dude. Know? It's like, <laughs> how do you get to that? How do you get over that hump? Yeah. You know what I mean? And I just, for some reason, bro, I, I couldn't, I couldn't get it to click. And I was studying, I was learning the industry. I was, I was studying all these salespeople and sales training. And I, I followed some people that were like really high end salespeople. And they had all this like, NEPQ, high level, seven steps and acronyms to all these sales things. And I'm just, I don't know, dude, I'm a, I'm a regular guy who grew up in the hood. Like I don't, and I'm, I'm not, I went to college, but I went to a community college, you know what I mean? And I don't have sales training and I'm like, that ain't me. And I was trying to make, I was trying to be other people, you know? And I started looking at, and, and this is, this is what the book comes in. Where, where it clicked for me is I, I felt like I was pretty mediocre, Marty. And my result, again, 60 grand in a year, whatever it is. May, some people think it's good. Some people think it's bad. It, it, it wasn't life-changing. I'll tell you that. Um, and I felt like I was not good, and I felt like I wasn't getting to a new level. I felt very stuck. You know what I mean? Like I had, like I had peaked. And I'm trying to figure it out, dude, but I'm watching people in the industry make three, four, five hundred grand a year selling. And I'm like, what on earth are they saying? What leads are they getting? What area do they run in? Like, what time do they make phone calls? Like, what's the trick? And my accounting background came into play because I did track my numbers the entire time. Like, I, I kept track of, like, how many phone calls I made every week, how many appointments I had, how many sales I made. I, I did track stuff. Again, I am an accountant. I am pretty analytical. And uh, I look back on it, man, and I look at my 2014 year. And one of the chapters of the book, which I'll show you, I have, I have a copy here. I don't know if y'all can see. One of the chapters, I think it's chapter four, is called 17. Uh, it is chapter four. 17 or the number that changed my life. And what happened, dude, is I'm sitting down and I'm looking at my activity, right? And I was making, I don't know, 150, 200 phone calls a month to leads, which is quite frankly, pathetic looking back. It's a really, really low number. And when I was in the warehouse, man, one of the, one of the best things I learned from it is like, I used to have to load um, trucks for restaurants, right? So we'd have a little pallet jack, I would get an order. And when I, when I got the order, it'd have a bunch of stickers on it. And I would put in the order number into a computer and the computer would tell me how long I had to, to, to make that order. Right. If Applebee's orders 75 things, it'd go, cool, you have 17 minutes and 22 seconds to fill this order. And I'd go up and down the aisles, think like a like a Costco. It was kind of like a big Sam's Club or Costco or something, big warehouse style. And I'd go up and down the aisle and I'd put stuff on the pallet. And if you if you didn't load it appropriately, sometimes things would fall off or you'd have to move things around to get them in the right order for the driver. Because it might be he might have 15 stops. So I had to like load things the right way and kind of get it all in. And, um, you know, at the end, I'd, I'd wrap it with the saran wrap, throw it on the truck, go pick up another order. And when you punch in the next order, the first one gives you a score. And it would go, all right, you were supposed to do it in 17 minutes. It took you 23. You're at 75% efficiency. Or it was supposed to take you 17 and you did it in 15. Great, you're at 120% efficiency. Right? And it kind of tracked. It knew how many boxes I had to pick up per hour to be efficient for them. And when I got into, when I started looking at my numbers here, I started looking at it and going, all right, a, a phone call takes me a minute. So right, if I'm making 150 of them a month, <laughs> that's like two and a half hours working the phones. Right? And this business is all about prospecting and presenting. That's this whole business. You prospect and you present. 
If you don't do those two things a lot, you don't make a bunch of money. So I start looking at that. I'm, I'm making dude like, I'm booking like 12 appointments a week at the time. And I'm probably presenting six or eight times a week because you get no shows and cancels and all the stuff. Right. And I'm like, all right, so call it eight a week. And a presentation was max an hour. So I'm like, all right, I'm doing eight hours presenting a week. I'm doing a couple hours of prospecting a week. And then I was doing some recruiting early on because I didn't know I want to build, but I was only talking to like a handful of people a week. And an interview takes 20 minutes, right? So if I did a handful a week, again, it's a couple hours. So I looked at it like I was at the warehouse and I'm like, all right, I'm eight hours presenting. I'm a couple hours on the phones and I'm a couple hours recruiting. Dude, I'm only putting like 12 hours a week into money-making activity, right? And I'm like, man, if I was at the warehouse... And I only loaded 12 hours worth of boxes in a 40-hour week. They would have fired me. Right? And I worked in a, I worked in a call center. I worked for AT&T. And I took inbound customer service calls. And it was the same way. They had a, a, a tracker on the, on the screen. And of the eight hours, I had to be on the phone physically talking to someone over 90% of the eight hours or I got fired. They could track it on the computer. So I started looking at this thing. And I'm like, all right, that's not really good. I start looking at the numbers though, and I was making at the time like four grand, I'm four or five grand a month. Like I said, 60 G's for the year. So call it five grand. And one day, Marty, I looked at the math and I went, all right, I'm making five grand and I'm making, you know, a couple hundred phone calls. And one day I divided one by the other. Right? And keep in mind, I'm frustrated. I hate chargebacks. I hate cancels. I hate when people hang up on me. I was super emotional. And I, when, when I got yelled at on the phone or whatever, I like would lose my mind. I couldn't. I, mentally, I couldn't handle it. But one day I do the math and I'm like five grand, couple hundred phone calls. And the math came out to $17 a phone call is what I was depositing, right? So we have the activity and we have our deposits. All the stuff in the middle is all the stuff everyone hates. That's, that's the headache. Do I make a sale? Do I not? Is it a big one? Is it a little one? Do they cancel? Do they not? Does it stay on the books? Does it not? Does it, you know what I mean? What's my precision? What's all the stuff? But your deposits account for all the stuff. And the activity is what gets you the deposit. So I looked at it and I'm like, but I'm not really good and having a crazy good result, but I'm making 17 bucks every time I call someone. And that was regardless of the outcome. It didn't matter if they hung up or can't, it didn't matter. That was just kind of what the average worked out to. And I was like, Yo, what if I do this for 40 hours? You know what I mean? Like if you gave me 17 bucks every time I called someone, dude, I'd call the phone book. I don't care. I wouldn't care. I'd call you a hundred times a day. I just wouldn't care. You know what I mean? And when I, when I had that like epiphany that no matter what the activity is, that equals money where most people in the industry only equate a sale to money and they equate a cancel or a chargeback to removing money. But to me, the activity equaled a net. And dude, I start looking at it and I'm like, all right, how do I get to 40 hours? And I just did basic math. And I'm like, if I, if I do, if I, if I book, and again, I come from the days of in-home kitchen table sales, not today's world with all the technology and ability to do, uh, um, yeah, you telephone, were literally tele -sales. You were driving to home. Oh, right? bro. I, yeah. Or flying. Dude, I used to fly to Utah to sell. Fly into markets. You would yes. fly into markets, buy leads yeah. in the market, stay there yeah. for a couple of weeks. Yep. Yeah. So I would, I would fly into Utah a lot. I'd make phone calls on Sundays in Atlanta in the morning. I'd fly there in the evening. I'd spend Monday through Thursday in Salt Lake City area. There was four counties I ran up there. Salt Lake, Utah, Davis, Weber County. And I would run Monday through Thursday up there. Thursday night, I would drive down four hours to St. George, Utah, and I would run all day Friday there. Then I would, Friday night, I would drive to Vegas and I'd take a red eye home and come home on Saturdays. But I'd make so, like- so when I, Yeah, so when I see people buying two or three leads and bro, not selling something- Stop. So, you're like, yeah. I just, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like, and, I, and I'd pick up 10, 15, 20 grand in five days, just working leads because that area had lead. Now in today's world, you can sit on your couch in your underwear and call the entire country. <laughs> Right? So I start, and I just want to give that clarity because in today's world with telesales, you can get in so much more activity than I was able to due to just straight up commute and technology and resources and what was available in the industry. 
you know? And with that, I always also have to say, dude, this industry, people may have been making money for a couple hundred years, you know? A.L. Williams built one of the biggest companies on the planet before there was technology, before there was leads, there was no phones, there was no nothing. And he built a multi-billion dollar company in this market with no tech, no CRM, no automation, nothing fancy, just seeing people. You know what I mean? So it's like today, what you can accomplish is bananas in, in today's world. And so many people take that for granted, dude. So I start looking at the numbers. And for me at the time, again, field sales, the numbers work very different today and you can get in more, but I'm just telling my story. I was like, if I want, if I see, if I present 20 times a week at an hour a pop, that's now 20 hours, right? If I make 600 phone calls a week at a minute a pop, 600 minutes, that's 10 additional hours. And if I interview 30 people a week and I, or 30, yeah, 30 people a week and I can do three an hour, that's 10 more hours. So I was going to spend 20 hours presenting, 10 hours on the phone prospecting, 10 hours on the phone recruiting, right? That's how I was going to get to my 40 hours, as if I was in the warehouse. That one change alone, dude, that year I issued on my own pen 460 grand from a dude who'd been messing around in the industry for five, six years. You know what I mean? I like, never talked, didn't talk to really anybody you knew, just, just purely... No, I've never, I've never sold someone I know. My mom told me no, to be clear. Yeah, John. Take so many of you have asked if there's an option for more access, more direct coaching. And so we've created a coaching platform called the Winner Circle, where you have a couple different options. There is a one-on-one -on -one option to where we can work directly with you on a regular basis. And then there's a small group setting, four to six people, really high achievers looking to get to just a new level in their career. We've had a ton of success in this already. First month, actually the first guy that joined deposited 7,500 bucks, worked with them back and forth, one-on-one. -on -one. The very next month, he deposited over 30 grand. So basically a 5X return on his income in 30 days. So if you're looking for something like that, you can click on the link below, get access to an application because I'm not taking everybody. I do want to make sure it's a good fit for both of us. And if we feel like you'd be a good fit, we'll set up a one-on-one -on -one call directly with me um, and kind of go through your struggles, what you need help with, and what I expect of people that are joining the coaching program. Um, so if you feel like it'd be a good fit for you and something you want more of, click the link below and we'll see you on the other side. Welcome to the winner circle. Take people through, because because this is a very different muscle for us, because yeah. our model is yeah. recruit, bring people in. They can either be sure. a client, agent, or a builder. It's yeah. a very, very different model. Take people through like a, a typical week of, hey, uh, and by the way, everybody, he's built agencies now, and I yeah. think you should talk to them about how you transition to that, John, but yeah. I think it'd be really helpful to, to as folks get acclimated, it, it, you know, they're in that thousand pound phone moment right now, yeah. these first few weeks. And so how did you go from, you know, it took you four years to have that epiphany, but, so, but you know, what was a typical good week for you in terms of how much you invested, yeah. what your week looked like? So I always go like, imagine me and Marty broke out a 20 and every time you dialed a lead, we gave you a $20 bill. How early would you start making phone calls? How late would you make phone calls until? How many days a week would we make phone calls? Like if you just knew the money was there, yeah, right? And that's how I built it, dude. I was like, I ain't mad at all the sales stuff. And I can teach sales. Like I teach it at a high level. But what I learned, dude, is activity trumps skill set all day long, all day long. I've had insanely talented people melt mentally in this business. You know, so for me, what I love about it, dude, is it's so duplicatable. Right, I think in the friends and family market, to me personally, it's granted y'all have built something massive, so it's clearly in some levels du duplicatable. But I can take anyone, and if they don't have a circle or a warm market or the ability or people with money or whatever, like someone like me, dude, I didn't have a big circle. I have a very small family. We're not well connected. I moved to Atlanta. I don't know P. I'm not one of those guys that has like a circle. You know, so for me to have generated business the way y'all do it, I didn't, I don't, I don't know how to do that, quite frankly. You know, today, in today's world, I have way more connections. You know, you start making some money, you get connections. <laughs> but uh -huh. traditionally, True. growing up, I didn't have a ton. You know, so what I loved about it is I could take someone who had desire to win and m merge them with people who inquired for something. Right, and I think the problem with, with this space that I see a lot of agents make the mistake is they go like, 
that was a bad batch of leads or those leads sucked or those leads. And they, they judged the lead, right? I'm like, what define, define a lead. Like, why is it the lead that's bad? Maybe you're bad. Does it make sense? Like at the beginning, I know it was me. I was bad. Does it make sense? Yeah. Well, so, we're going to use that as a response now, John. Yeah. Hey, I promise you it's, the, it's, it's more accurate than the other way. Yeah. You know, so. maybe the, again, is the approach incorrect? I, and, and for me, what I sure. do know is a lead is just a name and a number of someone who has a family. And you'll never convince me that that person doesn't love their family as much as you and I. You'll never convince me of that. Hmm. Does that make sense? And I know that family doesn't want to leave their loved ones in a bad situation to where they have to do the GoFundMe or beg for, fa- you know what I mean? Beg for money or lose their house or whatever it is. And the overwhelming majority, there's a zillion stats out there. You know them all from all the big firms that talk about the percentage of people that have no insurance. It's like half the people in the country have no insurance and some obnoxious number uninsured, you know? And it's like, ask yourself this. Have you ever met someone that's died and didn't have the appropriate coverage to take care of their family? I think everyone in every room I've ever been in can raise their hand. Yep. Does that make sense? So to me, a lead is, is someone just like me and you who loves their family. When the lead is yep. supposed to be someone that you call once and you make a sale, that's where the disconnect is. John, you said something to me the other day, and you said, hey, I, I call every lead nine times. I think you said nine. Yeah. Yeah. And you said, if somebody were to die, do that story. Like if somebody were to die and yeah. they had an opportunity so, for that 10, well, like, yeah, share yeah. that example. So I think it's really powerful. Here's what I always say. Think about this. And y'all can type this in. I love doing this little exercise, right? If, if, and I, I want hey, you guys, hey, hey, yeah, hey, I literally hey. want you guys to type in a number for me. If, if Marty and I got the most popular sales people on the planet, Whoever's written the biggest, baddest sales books ever. And we asked them, what is the average number of contacts it takes for a salesperson to make a sale? What do you think that number would be? The average number of contacts it takes for a person to make a sale. Yeah, right, look at all these crazy of, numbers. That's crazy. We've got 107. Okay. Four, yeah. Now. My question to you, this contacts. Now go, and I know the leads are new, so I don't know how, but I want sure. you to keep in mind. Now think about the average number of attempts to contact you make towards your leads. And dude, when I have people put the two numbers, they don't even attempt to contact them anywhere near as many times as they know it takes on average contacts. Now, there is a little... Like it doesn't take this many contacts in the insurance world to make a sale. But what I do know is everyone knows what the averages are and their attempts are typically significantly less. Why? Why do we attempt to call people so few times? Because we go, what if? And then negative words come out of our mouth. Oh, it's so powerful. What if they're mad? What if it's too early? What if they're at work? What if they're at dinner? What if it's too late? What if this? What if that? What if this? It's all this what if stuff, right? And what I always ask people, man, is like, fair to say whatever comes out of your mouth after what if, it's 100% made up. It's not real. Does anyone disagree? (laughs) What if, and you, something comes out, it's made up. So my thought is, if we're going to make it up, why don't we make up some good stuff? Does that make sense? What if you stop that family from losing everything? What if they pick up and thank you for coming over? What if you pick it up and they give you 27 referrals? What if you pick it up and they not only buy final expense, but they have money in 401k, IRA, savings that they can convert into annuity? What if, that, what if they become an agent? What, like, why not what if good stuff? You know. And what I always do, dude, is like, Imagine, let's just pretend for a second someone is mad. If you're doing it for the right reasons, what I do know with 100% certainty is if you're working, even if in your current book of contacts, even if you haven't bought a bunch of leads, there's someone that you've once attempted to contact 
that is now dead. That's happened for every person ever in this business, unless you've been in it for four days. Does that make sense? But if you've been working in the business for a hot minute, Ooh. there's someone yep. you have as a lead or a contact that is no longer alive. I can think of the name right now. Correct. Now, it's worse, dude, when you let someone push you off, don't follow up, uh, let them reschedule or cancel, and then you call, and they go, yeah, sorry, uh, Marty's passed away. I've had that happen so many times. It's like or when I was new, that bothered me. And what I always say to people is like, let's do this. Let's, let's pretend we could be in some crazy AI movie, right? And we had, we had the ability to see things differently than we see them. And a client dies. And think about the aftermath that happens to the, especially in the final expense market, right? Like, is anyone confused on what the average, what the average source of income is for someone in the final expense market? Like, what's, wh where's their income from? Social security. For sure. Right? What's the average number? It, it ain't high. Well, like, a, ain't. like a big one is like 1500 bucks a month. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. So we know that the majority of them are in a bad financial situation. So now if we think about what would happen if someone dies to their family, taking care of the funeral, Paying the final expenses, the cable bill, the car payment, the credit cards, the rent, the mortgage, the all the stuff, handling all the stuff, right? And let's just pretend that we have someone that passed away, and now they get to look down on their family and see all see the the shit storm that happened in their life. And you had the ability to go to them, and let's just say it's Marty, and I go, hey Marty. Now that you see what's happened with no insurance, I had the opportunity to call you nine times the Monday morning I got your inquiry, but I chose to call you only once because I was afraid you were going to be mad. Would Mart and I go, do you, would you have preferred I kept calling you knowing what you know today? Would you prefer I kept calling or are you okay that I didn't call because my emotions were in the way? Which, uh, pa so, which, which path would you choose? So good. Yeah, it's so good. Does it make sense? And yeah. no agent in the history of time, dude, has ever argued that point. Yeah. Because they, in the moment, dude, we put ourselves in the wrong situation and we put ourselves in this like sales situation. You know what I mean? Or like, dude, I've heard people go like, like my first year in the business, I made phone calls on Sundays because I was working. So I'd make phone calls on Sundays and I'd book appointments for Monday and Tuesday evenings. And I get agents that are sometimes like, work on Sunday? I mean, who would work on a Sunday? And I'm like, what do you do on Sunday? I mean, I watch the NFL and I watch golf. And I, you mean all the grown adults that are working on a Sunday? You watch them work? <laughs> like, you, you, you're okay that Applebee's is open to serve you. You're okay that Kroger and... Publix and Stop and Shop or wherever you shop is open. The gas stations, you're okay with other people working <laughs> to serve us. But somehow we get ourselves in a mind, like we just, we get ourselves in the wrong mindset, dude. And I think, again, if we can approach the lead from a standpoint of we're here to prevent chaos. And I wonder what the what if would be if they don't have this coverage and are you willing to own that it's your fault if someone dies without it. And I just wasn't willing to allow that, dude. So I, I started to go at this thing very differently. Um, and that didn't stop people from any of the stuff. Heck, you sell a bunch more, you know you get more cancels. And you get more chargebacks. And you get no-showed, like you deal with more stuff. So if you, if you can't get your mindset right when you're doing minimal effort, it's going to be brutal when you start having a lot of effort. If you can't keep your head right. You know, and I, dude, that one change, man, for me, between the activity and the mindset and looking at this thing and choosing to control how I looked at things, right? And then challenging agents when I speak to them through questions and, and, and giving clarity on understanding, bro, we started creating an army of people who just started going out and finding clients, i.e. families who wanted to help their family. And just helping them discover and identify problems and situations and solving it, dude. And the lead, the lead way 
allows you to get to so many people so fast because you can get unlimited leads, dude. I can get as many leads as I want tomorrow. Is I can literally get unlimited. You know what I mean? So it's like if you want to make a real good living and you want to help family, and be clear, we do help families. But I'm going to be real, dude. That is not what motivated me at first. Like I enjoy that piece of it today and it's cool what we've done. And you know what I mean? I could only help call it 30, 40, 50 families a month selling. But now today with thousands of agents, we're doing, I mean, we did like, I don't know, we're doing like 12,000 applications a month now. You know what I mean? Like I couldn't have that impact if I just kept to myself. You know, and so I, so I started teaching this strategy of activity and averages and numbers. And what I've learned, dude, is there's a lot of people out there who have very mediocre or low effort that are actually really good when you look at their averages. They just don't put in as much work as the people at the top. Almost across the board. You know, and so, dude, when I started looking at this thing that way, man, it started attracting a lot of people. I started teaching people how to, you know, net 250 plus on their own pen. And it was everyday people like me, bro. And it just started becoming very attractive, you know, and, and, and I enjoyed teaching it and I enjoyed challenging people. And I didn't have to be the, again, what, what I love about the like, do more now, get better later. My strategy was like, I know I'm making 17 bucks a call. I've spent three years trying to get really good to somehow have a 90% closing ratio and be able to sell four apps in every house and get 22 refer. I was trying, I was trying to like keep the activity and get my skill set so high, my income doubled or tripled. And I just made a mental decision, Marty, to go, what if I just scrap that for right now? What if I just do more of what I am? I am who I am, dude. Y'all are who you are in the current moment. And I always challenge people with this, bro. I could give you some sales stuff. But what are the chances that I can make someone triple 3x as good a salesperson by tomorrow? I can 3 extra scale set, sales skill set in one day. What are the odds of that? Versus, can you make three times as many phone calls tomorrow? I can do one with a near 100% accuracy. And yep. the other is just really low. And, you know, for me, man, in teaching the thing, I have to have like mistakes and objections and issues to be able to tweak someone. You know, it's like Maddox, dude. He plays baseball. He's 12. He plays baseball and golf. If he doesn't go out there and take a bunch of swings at the golf ball or the baseball, all the training in the world about what to do with his elbow is useless. But if he goes out and takes a bunch of swings and we practice a lot, now I can slowly tweak things. And in this well, businessman, sure. if you give me 40 objections on the phone tomorrow, bro, I can, I can tweak some stuff. If you give me 20 presentations this week and you miss a bunch, I can tweak some stuff. If you give me two, I'm like, ah, yeah. I just, so I'm, I'm not going to pretend I'm that good, you know? And I just, dude, I feel like if I train on that stuff with low activity, I feel like I'm lying to people and telling people that the words I'm saying are so good that if you just say these magic words, you'll be rich. And I just don't believe that, dude. I think I'm completely lying to people if I do that. You know what I mean? So it's like, we need the combo. We need high activity and we need coaching and consult. Like we need both. But you get, you get the, the skill comes with repetitions, right? Correct. I guess what I was talking about it's like, I, what, I, what I love about what you're saying here, John, and, and I think everybody's probably getting this, but I'm going to say it anyway, yeah. is what he's talking about is relatable to, to all of life, right? Correct. For, for this final expense, you know, beta test that we're trying, but all of recruiting, getting ICAs, get, getting, you know, yep. getting friends in the, get, getting every area of your life, you can uh, deploy mm -hmm. what John's talking about and become better. Um, and I, I just love it. I think about, um, at, you know, athletics and like yeah. fitness and every, you know, all the areas of your life. If you, 100%. if you put in more reps, you get better. You will, uh, you become more natural at it. Yeah. Uh, speaking, you know, act, you know, calls, everything. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think if you break down what we're talking about here today, and I think for this group team, 
we've got to get more people, back to Michael's opening comment, we've got to get more people buying hundreds of leads, not a handful of leads, yeah. so that you can get more at bats, so that you can get better at this, Correct. to John's point, because that's that's when you'll truly know. Now, no, this is not us stopping, to John's point, what we've done and how we've built mm -hmm. a, a $100 million plus business. This is augmenting it and adding to it. Uh, so that we become the most rounded distribution organization out there. But this is absolute gold, John. I appreciate this. You know what's funny, dude, is a lot of agents hesitate to buy leads because they're afraid of the risk. Right? That's a that's a that's a fear. Ah, I'm risking I'm risking my money. And I again, I don't I don't have a clue what pricing. I I know the business, so I'll ballpark it. But like, I don't know. Let's say you buy ten leads. We, we've years. asked people to buy $1,000 in a month to oh. be in this beta. <laughs> Cute. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, knew, I said it because I wanted you to hear it. Cute. Like, I, so I, here's, here's the thing, dude. If we, if we measured activity and tried to, if I had a timer on everybody who buys leads, and I, I literally hit the time. It's like chess. You ever see people play chess and they hit the little button when it's their turn and they turn it off and they play that little game where the timer goes? If you had a timer on when you were making phone calls and when you were making presentations and you only spent, and if you want me to be completely transparent, dude, I will. If you yeah. spend a thousand bucks a month, your timer will never in the history of time get to 40 hours a week. You don't, it doesn't give you the ability to be full time. And what I've learned, dude, is one of the biggest mistakes I see in this industry, bro. I walk into rooms all over this country and speak. And I go, how many, think again, how many people are full-time insurance agents? Y'all can type full-time if you're full-time. I'd love to see it. But it's like, how many of y'all are full-time insurance agents? <clears throat> right? And then I go, how many of y'all present 30 times a week? So, yeah, right? Like how many of y'all present? And if I do the math and I take your presentations and your phone calls and I add it up, dude, every room I'm in, the average is like eight hours. I even in one room, dude, I had like 500 people. And I took, I, I found who in the room ran the most appointments for the week. I found a different person who made the most phone calls for the week. They weren't the same person. And then a third person who had the most recruiting interviews for that week. And I combined all of them and the hours came up to 32. You know what I mean? And what I've learned, dude, is most people call them full time. Some they most agents call themselves full time because this is the only job they have. That's the definition of full time to most agents. It's not because they put in the hours to consider themselves full time. You know, and dude, so if you, do, I always tell agents, man, if you don't have the ability to get in. Again, in telesales, the average, the average presentation, especially in this demographic, is 30 minutes. And hell, some you'll be done with in four minutes because it doesn't go anywhere and it's not an actual presentation. But I'm saying presentation with a sale, 30, 45 minutes max. So our, our top guys are doing 30, 40, 50 presentations a week. You don't make real money. And you just physically can't do that on limited lead spend, right? You just And so what I tell people, dude, is if you don't put in the effort, the time, the investment. And again, if you have a way to prospect without it, amen, keep doing it. But if you aren't presenting enough, I'm not mad at it. I used to be frustrated by it, but now I just, I let people know, bro, this, incons this, this business will be inconsistent and suck forever if you don't have high activity. It will be inconsistent and suck forever unless you're one of the far end anomalies. You know I mean, if you're a guy that can present five, 10 times a week and make a million, hey amen, keep doing you. But I know that's not insanely duplicatable, so I don't train on it, bro. What I was saying about the lead thing, man, is, is people do it for risk, right? So call it 250 bucks a week. And I don't know what leads cost. Let's just say they're 25 bucks. That gets you 10. I mean, maybe they're a little less, maybe they're a little more, whatever those, the number those is. Are our, those are our most expensive leads. So, Perfect. So yeah, yeah we've got good again, lead Yeah, so call it. Call it 10. Again, you can you, the, take the concept and adjust the numbers. 10 leads can't get you 20 presentations. 
I'm not sure a machine at referrals, but I'm saying direct presentations. It doesn't give you the ability. So from the leads, not only do you have to cover your lead cost, you have to cover your bills, right? And so I go, I, if, 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 I don't know, again, 10 leads, maybe you sell two to make your money back and pay your bills. So it's like, would you rather have to sell two out of 10 or if you buy, in my world, dude, I don't hire people if they're not spending a thousand a week. I won't bring them on as full time. And in that case, now instead of 10, you get 40 leads, right? But it's a thousand bucks. So maybe you got to make two sales to cover your lead bill and another two sales to cover your bills. So I go, would, what odds are, would you rather face? Clo having to close two out of 10 to barely scrape by? Or would you rather only have to close four out of 40? Like statistically, which one has the better odds? 10 shots or 40 shots? You know what I mean? And dude, most yep. people are putting themselves at the most high risk position because they don't want risk. But I'm like, it's actually significantly more risky to get less leads because your break even point is so hard to hit with limited effort. It's just, it's really hard to convert 10 leads into profit. You know what I mean? Again, maybe it's they're cheaper and you get 15 or 20. The point is you have so few at-bats, man, that we see when agents go all in on leads and they front load their expense, first of all, you know how quick you can get paid in this industry, especially in this market. It's not an IUL. It's not an annuity, dude. These don't take long. You sell an app today, get an e-app, get an instant. You can get paid the next day, two days, whatever it is with most carriers. Yep. So if you front load it and you spend – a higher number, you can see people and start turning apps like this. And people always get wild with me, dude. And they go a thousand dollars a week. Oh my God, that's 52 grand a year in leads. And I'm like, here's how I think about it, dude. Like if I went to Vegas and I took a thousand bucks and I played blackjack and I won a few bucks, right? I win three grand. And then I take the three grand and I go play poker and I put a thousand bucks down and I win another three grand. Did I really spend two? I really only went with the first thousand. I just reinvested. I just took that same thousand dollars, put it on blackjack, made the profit, took the same thousand dollars, put it on the next table and made the profit. And so many agents get so caught up in the lead spend total. And I'm like, you know, if you spend the thousand and you make Two, three, four thousand. Which be clear, the ROI on that is obnoxious when you annualize it. And y'all are smart enough and you're in the IUL annuity world, you can figure out the math. If you make the two, three, four grand back after spending a thousand and you put the thousand back into leads, is it really spending more money? Or is it just putting the same thousand dollars back in? Right? And so for me, I just taught people to take the thousand dollars, turn it into cash, and put the thousand back in faster. So yeah, y'all are doing it over the course of a month. I'm like, why are we taking a month to do it? Why don't we do it in two days? It's the same thousand dollars. Why drag it out 30 days? Why not knock that process out in four days, five days, six days, seven days? And fl it's just flipping the same thousand bucks over and over and over again. You know, I mean, again, no different than if I go buy a house, I flip it, I sell it, I make the profit, I take the money, I put it into a new house. I didn't spend double. I spent the same money twice. You know what I mean? And if people could grasp those couple concepts, man, this thing yeah. is wildly profitable. Yeah, it's it's really. I mean, John could uh, obviously uh, he he could, and we probably will have you back, John. I mean, this is just absolute gold for our team. Um, I, I hope everybody extracted incredible value from my dear friend John today, uh, just about business in general. I mean, I I you know even beyond the. Uh, the purchasing of leads and how to do that effectively. I think what John taught us is what it takes to have the right mindset to be successful in business and life. Um, and, and for that, I think the the lessons today were invaluable. And I do, I do want to encourage everybody to give John's book a look. Um, I've personally read it. He sent me a, 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 an autographed copy of it and uh, I, I read it the week he, he gave it to me. Um, and so uh, it's a great, it's great testament to his, his uh, professional uh, career and everything he's done to build something from literally nothing. 
a wonderful industry changing example of that. So I want to thank you, John, on behalf of the whole company for being here today. Yeah, you got it, dude. And if they get it on the website, johnwetmore.com, I see a few people bought it. I don't know where you bought it, but if you go to johnwetmore.com, you'll get it signed too. My team, they're literally, my team distributes them from upstairs um, and we put it out um, with a oh, signed cool. personalized copy. Com. Yeah, just go to John Wet, literally click on book. Yeah, and it come, it'll come, I'll literally sign every one of them. John um, speaks all over the country. Uh, he does the 8% Nation with Cody. He does obviously a ton with his own agency. He's just a, he's just a great industry ambassador and a, and a great guy. Yeah, I appreciate it, dude. If y'all, um, if I can help with anything else, please let me know. Um, again, you can you can follow me on on there on Instagram, all that stuff. I love to hear the stories. Yeah. So if y'all have something cool and get something out of it, tag me for sure. And we have a yeah, if, throw, if you don't throw mind, your Instagram handle on there, Tom. It's just at John Wetmore. Someone Melody typed the the website. I'm pretty simple. Just W E T uh-huh. at John Wetmore. And uh, I have a little school community too with a ton of free trainings. John Wetmore.com slash school. If you want to follow anything I do, would love it. Whatever I can do to help you guys, dude. I know I'll uh, I'll be visiting with you soon and and look forward to more, dude. If I can help at all or can answer any questions, just let me know. Bro. Awesome, brother. Appreciate you.